Let's move on to Bill Maher's appearance on The View, where he talked about, uh, in fact, the, the conflict in the Middle East and how it has roiled American college campuses. If you're wondering, why do I need to hear what Bill Maher said on The View, I understand. But it's, pretty, it's a pretty interesting, fiery exchange uh, that I think that leaves a lot to be discussed. So with that set up, please enjoy Bill Maher uh, getting into a little bit of a, a fight with Sonny Hostin, a little uh, left-on-left violence here over, quote, wokeness on The View. Well, I had a different question, but, I, but, but it struck me that in, in the first segment you used the term woke and you said that woke is what was sort of ruining everything. And I know that you're... A, no, I didn't a, say ruining everything. I said that's why Trump could get reelected. That's why Trump could get reelected. Yeah. So I, I just, the term woke has been, in my view, co-opted by the right and weaponized and bastardized. And um, so I was surprised to hear you use the term because historically, as you know, because I think you're quite brilliant, that woke is a word used by the black community to note that we must be aware of social injustices. But words migrate. Why why is that a bad thing? It's not a bad thing. And and originally that was uh, absolutely a great thing. Alert to injustice. Who's not for that? But words do migrate. Now, I'll use any term you want. Okay. Because maybe that is a word that's triggering, and so we let's not use that word. I don't know, want to call it the, the super far left, but don't tell me the left had... the super far right. Well, he's well, talking about the left. Well, then okay, but, but we talked about that. I mean, I think we agree about the danger of the super far right, and I, well, you know, I can't say it enough. I think they're the bigger threat. Um, but don't tell me that the left hasn't changed. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when it was the conservatives who hated the Jews. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was a joke. But, uh, <laughs> too dark. But, too but, dark. But, well, Welcome maybe it is, but it's, <laughs> but it's true. I mean, you know, if, if I had any doubt that I was right about the change that's happened in the left, watching people protest for a terrorist organization like Hamas, uh, that straightened me up pretty quick. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about that because I, I think I, you're almost a free speech absolutist. You believe totally yes. in the right to say what you believe. But I think a lot of us were disturbed to see terrorist flags being waved on American college campuses <laughs> and seeing this um, a generation that may, some I think genuinely care about the play of the Palestinians. I think most Americans <laughs> do. But some who seem to be embracing a terrorist organization over the nation of Israel. What do you make of this moment? What do you think it's a result of? How do we fix it? Well, I, I mean, it's just astounding to me that they can't tell the good guys from the bad guys. <clears throat> I mean, just the, morally. I mean, let me tell you, if you're for Hamas, just live in Gaza for a day. And I'm not talking about while the war is on. I mean, before the war. Mm-hmm. Trust me, you would go running and screaming and begging to live in Tel Aviv, mm-hmm. a place that has your values. I mean, women have no, I mean, this is a show watched by a lot of women. Women have no rights right. in this place and a lot of majority Muslim countries around the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is no equal rights as far as speech, dress, opportunities for education, uh, reproductive rights, freedom from sexual violence, freedom from sexual harassment. The LGBTQ community as well, I mean, yes. You, 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 uh, that too. Uh, but you, you, you throw around the term apartheid. Mm-hmm. There is a gender apartheid in a lot of the world mm-hmm. where women are second-class citizens. Uh, at best. Are you, are you at but, all concerned about the innocent civilians that have been collectively punished and, and murdered, largely it, well, children and, and, and women? Of and course. are you at all concerned about of, the fact that the International Criminal Court just today issued a subpoena for uh, Bibi Netanyahu? Well, that's, that's ridiculous, but it's a war. Why? It's a war. Because it's a war, and they were attacked, and they're defending themselves. Okay. Well, where to start there? I I will say, uh, exceptionally substantive discussion for The View, and I mean that in the literal sense, exception. (laughs) It was an exception uh, to how those conversations normally go. Um, How about, we could start with his claim that if you lived in Gaza before October 7th, you would go running and screaming to say, let me out of here. And I want to go live in Tel Aviv. Yeah. Isn't that what everybody in Gaza was doing? (laughs) I mean... Like, that so strips all of the context out of the situation. Yes, it It, does. It it forgets the fact that nobody in Gaza could leave. Yeah. And no, it's not... (laughs) They weren't trapped in Gaza because of Hamas. Like, he's like, if you lived in Gaza, you'd want to leave. 
Okay. So do a lot of people in Gaza for, uh, to go visit their families in the West Bank, to visit their families elsewhere uh, in the world, to get medical appointments, uh, to do business. Yeah. But they are not allowed to leave by Israel. Like that, that is a kind of a relevant detail. But this, this is- This whole question when he's saying good guys and bad guys. But that's where this becomes a cycle because he would say, you know, in part, of course, yes, they are being stopped from that by Hamas because Hamas is the de facto government and there's this like- What about before Hamas? Exa- yeah. And that's what I was just gonna say, that this that conversation, I, I think it loses its worth when you're trying to have a broad discussion with no context for why there is extremism uh, in Hamas, in Hamas, of course in Hamas, but in Gaza and among so many people. And that's a reaction, obviously, to years and years of conflict um, that has put people in living conditions that you wouldn't wish on your own family. And so when you aren't talking about that, it's obviously an issue. Yeah, and, and Bill Maher is just flat out Islamophobic. And I, I, I wonder at this point if he would even like quibble uh, with, with that claim, and you're seeing an expression of it there. But even in Bill Maher's, uh, own, on Bill Maher's own terms, uh, the, the Palestinian resistance, the Palestinian political structure, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, up into the 2000s was much more secular. Yeah, uh, it's changed. Un, until, yeah, yeah. until uh, this kind of militant armed resistance element grew up because the Palestinian people uh, believed that the Oslo Accords and the, and, the, and the negotiating process with Likud in, in power, insisting that there would be no two states ever, mm-hmm. uh, was a dead end. And, mm-hmm. you, and, and you needed a more militant uh, direction to change the equation. Like, as, as we talked about in that debate with, uh, with Destiny and Omar, any time that peace was on the horizon, support for Hamas would plummet. Any, any time that, it, that that was taken off the table, support for Hamas would rise. And so if Bill Maher actually you know, wants to strip uh, Hamas and, and the Islamist elements uh, that's, that it, it kind of coursed through it, the way to do it would be su- supporting actual uh, peace efforts, yeah. not by just tightening the, the occupation. And then, and then, and then, complaining that about the resistance to the occupation. And this is probably the rub uh, for me. And I think some people on the right, not a lot, of people, not a lot of other people on the right, but th- that conversation about militant extreme Islamism, I think, is an important one. We probably, I don't know if we've ever even talked about that, but we probably disagree on some points of it. Um, but I also probably share some of Bill Maher's concerns in that respect. But if you are doubling down on the current strategy to quell mm-hmm. uh, extreme militant Islamism. If that's your strategy at this point, is to double down on the strategy that has failed for decades, and in fact, arguably, even by their own argument, has exacerbated the conditions, you're not making anybody safer at this point. It's, yeah. it's just clearly not working. Um, you know, that it doesn't excuse violence. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are some people that will make that argument, but it, just, it doesn't. It does help explain it. Right. It does help explain why nothing is changing. Right, and also Ben Gavir and, and the rest of them, when it, comes, uh, when it comes to women's rights and women's place in society, that entire growing massive faction of, of Israeli society uh, is not far from Hamas and the other Islamists when it comes to kind of the religious fundamentalism. And Bill Maher has this blind spot when it comes to that. Like, I mean, I'd rather live in Israel any day as a woman than in... For now, well, like on the current trajectory, See, let's check in again in 20 years. Uh, you know, the, there are intense forces um, within Israel's you know, political space that are uh, trying to make sure that that's not the case in, in 10, 20, 30 years. It's, it, the, the conversations about this are so hamstrung by the aperture. You know, like just not being able to zoom out. I agree, I, I think not being able to zoom out and honestly appraise uh, what's happening in the, sort of from the 30,000 foot view is a really, really, one of the biggest challenges I think we've had like in the media since October 7th. And I also think you're just, people uh, have 
turned a blind eye, like sort of willfully ignored a lot of the long-term problems here uh, because they've been told over and over again by American intelligence and, uh, you know, the Pentagon that there's one thing happening. And, you know, they trusted that for a long time and, and don't have as much trust in that anymore. Actually, that's what we're about to talk about, honestly, uh, in the polling block. <laughs> Yeah, we'll move to that in a second. I can't find the essay now, but there's a really good essay that was that I read recently, making the case that basically there are two Israels uh, right now. Mm. Um, there's the calling one Judea and Samaria, and the other Israel. One, one a kind of secular, but ethno, obviously ethno-religious, yeah. um, but more the Tel Aviv high tech, like cosmopolitan, uh, and the other, the kind of fundamentalist orthodox. Um, element that is increasingly powerful within the Netanyahu coalition, and that and that those two Israels basically can't can't coexist, uh, and and they're locked in a in a death struggle with each other. And I think a lot of that poured into the streets when the judicial reform, um, which I think we actually disagreed on at the time, but when that was up, you, you saw that it's it's kind of a culture clash. I mean, it absolutely is a culture clash, mm -hmm. um, and so it's a obviously going to be uh, a, a huge. Uh, whatever happens militarily, this is a, a huge, like front and center, um, like maybe the biggest political uh, thing happening in Israel right now is increasingly that divide. Yeah. Hey, if you liked that video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to Breaking Points. If you want to see the rest of CounterPoints, go to breakingpoints.com to become a premium member and get the full uncut show every morning in your inbox and on Spotify.